Adi's been a real inspiration uh, in a time when in our country we need inspiration of leading this resistance to this Trump administration, but more importantly than that, fighting for something, especially for everybody in this country to be able to get good health care so that we understand that health care is a human right. Hello, y'all. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Welcome. Hi, good to see Hi. you. Rachel. I'm Rachel, so yeah, nice to meet you. To meet Thank you. you for coming. Hi, what's your name? Kyle. Great to meet you. Good to meet you. Welcome Adi. to Santa Barbara. Thank you. This is the first time I've been here. It's good to meet you. Columbia yeah, graduation. Columbia, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I recognize that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in that one? A baby Carl. Baby Carl, yeah. Oh, so wow. this was just a few weeks before Audie was diagnosed. Actually, we were at a friend's wedding in Northern California during uh, when Audie was protesting against the Republican tax bill in December 2017. And that was also right around when he started using a wheelchair. So it's been, you know, a pretty steady progression since yeah. then. <laughs> Daddy! Yeah. Yeah. Daddy. Okay, bud, should we go outside and let Abba and Julian talk a little bit? I have to say, as a movement organizer, I really admire the work your mother did. You watched her build La Raza Unida as a political activist and help win real power for people in marginalized communities. Yeah. You have said she was a defining influence on you. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? What you learned growing up going to organizing meetings and watching your mom fight for justice? I'm very proud of my mom. I'm convinced that if my mom had not been involved the way that she was, that my brother Joaquin and I probably wouldn't have gotten into politics, into public service. When my brother and I were growing up, my mom would drag us to meetings and to speeches and to rallies and we'd be waiting for three hours while the adults talked in the other room about organizing. And at the time, I hated it. My mother, when she was active, her and her generation, they always had a greater hope for their kids. So the other thing that I learned was that your victories don't always come right away. As you know, I would like to focus the bulk of our discussion today on healthcare. It is obvious that our healthcare system is in crisis. Millions are uninsured. This system is not working for anybody, unless of course, you are a pharmaceutical or insurance executive. I am curious, does anyone in your family have personal experience with the healthcare crisis that way? Yeah, you know, I grew up with a grandmother that had type 2 diabetes. But the godsend was that she had Medicare. We had some ability to be able to afford the health care that she needed. I've also had relatives that were out of a job, that couldn't afford medication, you know, couldn't afford to go see the doctor. And then I compare that to my grandmother, and that's why you know, I believe that we need to build out our health care system around Medicare to make it available to everybody who, who wants to be on it. I want to show you a video. It was recorded by Matt, who lives in New York, and his mother Koki, who is a registered nurse. Their story is a harrowing one, and yet it's an experience that's become all too common in this country. As a teenager, I was rationing my insulin, managing my diabetes that way, and I ended up uh, passing out, and my roommates, uh, sorry, they, they carried me to the hospital. I said, don't take me to the emergency room. I can't afford to pay for it. Because I didn't even have money for insulin. So I was like, how am I supposed to pay for an emergency room bill? If Matthew had had access to insulin when he was 19, 20, 21, it would have been much cheaper than him going into the hospital. He and all these patients that I've taken care of would greatly benefit from Medicare for all. As Republicans try to figure out how to take away people's care and give more money to the insurance companies, Democrats are debating different paths forward. What would your approach be as president, and what bill would you ask Congress to send you? My approach, I see it as an approach that's built off of Medicare with basically a private option. 
so that ultimately that everybody will be essentially on a Medicare-based system. If somebody has a solid health insurance plan, private health insurance plan, that you're gonna have some time period where they're able to hold on to that. But I believe in the competition between those two that ultimately we're gonna to get to a point of a system that's based off of Medicare. I have quote unquote good private insurance, but it doesn't cover long-term care. So now we are scrounging to pay a crazy 9,000 month for 24 hour care. This is why I support Medicare for all. I think that, that the example of your insurance is a very appropriate cautionary tale about the shortcomings of private health insurance. Because I think that a lot of people don't foresee that they may find themselves in a situation that they're gonna need certain type of coverage, or they believed under the plan that it would be there, and then it's denied. So we need to make sure that to the extent there is any private health insurance, that that private health insurance actually is solid and strong. A recent survey found that a majority of all voters supported Medicare for all and the phase out of private plans if they can keep their doctor and hospital. Do you agree that people like their doctors and not their private insurance plans? Oh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I think the relationship that people have is with their doctor, not with their private health insurance plan. I agree with that. And I think that it, it means that we need to strengthen reimbursement rates, particularly in, to, to um, doctors in, in rural communities, for instance, to ensure that physicians are able to keep that relationship with their patient and be there for their patients. You have stated numerous times that you believe undocumented immigrants should get the health care they need. How would you make that a reality as president, especially given the new public charge rule and other laws that prevent undocumented immigrants from getting necessary health care? I think there are two steps. Number one is immediately the administration would begin to undo the rules that were implemented by Health and Human Services or any of the other departments on public charge. And then secondly, as we do healthcare legislation, we're gonna to need to include that an undocumented immigrant would be able to avail himself or herself of healthcare. But I do believe that we're gonna have a Democratic president, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic House at 12.01 p.m. on January 20th, 2021. And that if the decision is between making sure that everybody has good health care or this 60 vote filibuster rule, I'm going to choose getting health care to everybody, including making sure that undocumented immigrants are able to get the care that they need, even as we put them on a pathway to citizenship. Thank you. <coughs> Secretary Castro, since my diagnosis, I have been thinking a lot about my legacy. I hope that people in my life remember me as someone who advanced the cause of justice. How do you want to be remembered? It's weird for me to think about a legacy, but I hope that people will remember me as somebody that tried to do good for other people, tried to help other people. I believe that that's a good word, that we should go into politics, into public service to help people. And I hope at the end of my public service that people will say that I helped a lot of people. Thank you for what you said. And thank you again so much for coming here. I have enjoyed the conversation and truly believe your voice is one the American people need to hear. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it has been a privilege to meet you.